everybody. This is Ferdy with Falcon Talk, and I have my usual crew. I have Samurai Sandy, Awesome uh, Andres, and the all knowledgeable, all knowing Kempo Joe in the house. And Kempo's, uh, Kempo Joe is um, with me live here, and I have uh, Sandy and Andres um, on Facebook chat forum. And uh, Andres, I like your new cut. You look like a freaking uh, Shaolin uh, monk. All you need is those little holes on there, you know. <laughs> and, and, and get and get the uh, get the robe. So, uh, how's everybody tonight? Doing good. Better. Preparing for this tropical storm that's coming. Yeah, well, we got part of it today here in Jersey. Yeah, it's been raining really bad here all day in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyways, uh, tonight, tonight's topic is different types of martial arts schools. And, um, and I'm not talking about styles, but I'm talking about types. Okay. And like, uh, for example, um, my first uh, type of schools is what I would call the uh, traditional martial arts school. And usually, the way I look at it, the traditional, you know, um, they they do all the the traditional bowing, traditional um, terms. Usually, uh, the traditional school is probably some the the owner is someone from the old country. Not always, but usually is. And um, they do the whole gambit. They they do you know the uh, teach the values, they teach, um, I guess, the philosophy, you can say, and uh, everything's very t traditional. Yeah. So what do you guys have to say about anything about the traditional schools? I, to go first. I, I like the traditional schools. It feels like not only are you training in an art, but you're bringing the history to life because you're not taking out all of the... Um, how do I word this? I want to say the respect, but that's not what I mean. Um, you're taking, you're not taking out all of the ceremony that goes, that went into how the previous martial artists trained, how the previous technicians trained it. You're bringing it forward, so it's it's like you're bringing history alive when you do it. Mm -hmm. So I really like the traditional school. Yes. And yeah. how, what about you, Kempo Joe? Well, I mean, uh, like I said, I, I, I teach I teach traditional classes. I teach classical classes. I teach modern classes. When I'm doing a traditional class, you know, we, we, we like in jujitsu and in kobujitsu, you know, we, we speak in Japanese as well as English. They have to learn the vocabulary and terminology. Um, they have to bow, you know, tra traditional. We say reshiki and kokoro, uh, uh, etiquette and courtesy. Uh, again, they, they bow to a kamiza, uh, traditional shrine. They bow to each other with proper courtesy. Uh, the terminology all is in the indigenous language of that particular country. So if you're doing jujitsu, you speak, you're learning Japanese. Uh, if you're learning mm -hmm. uh, certain kung fu systems, you're Mandarin or Cantonese. Uh, again, you know, I, I, I had learned... Uh, uh, Actually, most of my Korean training, ironically, did not utilize a lot of Korean, all things considered. I mean, you talked about the Pumse or the Hyungs, but uh, a lot of it wasn't wasn't said in Korean, you know? Uh, um, interesting. But like I said, that's what they learn the culture. They learn the culture. Yes, yes, definitely. Definitely you learn the culture. I always say, especially, uh, I think... Um, with the Filipino culture, one of the vehicles of bringing the Filipino culture to um, other people has been the Filipino martial arts more than anything. I think the Filipino martial arts has really um, uh, piqued interest in um, the people with um, their culture because sometimes you wonder, you wonder like, why is this this way? Why? Like last week, I, I got a laugh at last week when when uh, Joe was talking about Wing Chun, 
and t- on top and then showing um different you know with the front and the back what he called the anti bang techniques. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's funny, but it's true. That's what, it's true. great. It's great. Yeah. It's great. John, we and were going through. No, oh, sorry. You there? One of the funniest thing, movements is this that, movement, which you cross the arms in front of your chest. And people are going, what is it? I've got boobs. Don't touch them. Don't touch my boobs. Take it away. <laughs> Don't touch my boobs. We, you know, and it, I reach my boobs, I slap it up. I reach my boobs, I slap them down. And, you know, I, the women I say that the women, they're like, oh, my gosh, it's there. I go, yeah, it is. But we don't think about it in that context. So it's sad that so many times, because of sometimes the traditional or classical orientation of certain classes, that we're, we're so used to learning the classical orientation that we, we fail to lose, we lose the humanity. We lose the practical application and understanding. Yes, that's that's key word to practical application. With that, I mean, I mean, um, like you you um, gave light last week also when you were saying that a lot of the uh, Japanese um, jujitsu they have um, you know defense against wrist grabs, and you're saying why they would grab the wrist because the guy was going to go and draw his sword. It makes total sense. You know, you appreciate it. All right, Andres, you're, you're, you're sitting back. Um, what are you, in your garage or your basement? Yeah, I'm in the garage, man. Okay. It's garage basement. Okay, so what do you feel about traditional? That's kind of in the States. Like, I was a kid in the 80s, came of age in the 90s, like, kind of thing, right? So... Have you ever have you I mean, ever like, studied in a in, like, traditional Taekwondo school? And then like mm-hmm. Kenpo. So I mean like I don't know like Taekwondo is I guess pretty traditional, but it was already sport by nineteen eighty eight. Yeah. And then Kenpo, like as much as we had the courtesies, like I don't know if it was like an actual like, I've been to Aikido school, schools that were, like, way more traditional than, like, the camp post school that I was 12 years old. Say, Sandy, okay. Sandy, Sandy's, Sandy's dojo that she's um, referring to, I, I, think... I would actually say it's beyond traditional. I'd say it's classical. I've been to that dojo. They run it very classically. I mean, oh, when, yeah. you, when we, you go into we, their we, training, I've you watch too. they operate their classes. You, it, it's very, I mean, I think it's beyond traditional. I think it's very classical, like you, what you would learn at a classical Japanese dojo. And I was really impressed with that. I was like, wow, you know, I mean, the history and the notifications and the understandings of, of the history. And, and uh, I mean, you know, you walk into that dojo, I mean, it's a museum. All these incredible photographs of all these different uh, 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 Japanese masters and different Kodu or old oh, it's, school. It's, um, it's a Ujutsu. nice dojo. It's a nice. I it's say a humble. shrine, man. It's a- it, it is. I, I like. You know, I, I got a kick out of that place. I really did. You know. So maybe that's a better term, other than traditional, because Andres was correct when he said. I mean, there's a difference between traditional and you know, maybe it's a better term to say a classical. Classical, school. yeah. Yeah, because, mm-hmm. like, he's right. Traditional boxing, we think of Rocky, we think of punching a meat, uh, a side of beef. But in right, some Rocky. boxing schools, they actually have these punching machines that you punch. So I can see what he's saying, what do you mean by tradition, because, yeah, yeah boxing, okay. you know. All right, so I have the next one would be, like, sports-oriented. You know, that they train mostly for tournaments. And um, that was like my last judo. Um, my last judo. I was living in North um, Jersey. And uh, the dojo was actually a high school gym. And there were about, I would say, in the class, maybe about 100 people. And they would break it down. But the... Um, the sensei, Clyde, geez, I forgot his last name, who was national champions 
in the U.S. in judo, and actually he was training a girl who was an aspiring um, Olympic um, judo player. And this was back in, I think, 2000, was it 2008 or 2012? I can't remember. Um, and the girl was actually, um, her father was a, a judo champion in the Olympics. You know, and this, this guy, he, was he Alan totally, you know, by any chance? It, huh? Was Excuse me? Alan Cohen by any chance? No, no, no. Um, his name was Clyde. Oh, geez. I forgot his last name. It was, uh, it was, it was, the place was called Tech Judo in uh, North Bergen, um, New Jersey. And uh, the girl that he was tra um, training to go into the Olympics was a girl named uh, Tony Geiger. And um, for some reason, she actually placed, um, she was a third runner up on the Olympic trials. Oh, wow. She was heavyweight. She was a strong girl, very pretty girl, but very strong. And she was a, and she was the probably one of three girls, and the rest were all guys. And the way that um, Clyde ran it, it was, um, you know, he he was looking for um, the uh, players, the uh, judo players that he could um, take to um, competition. So. He was kind of um, more of a, like a wrestling coach than a uh, judo sensei. But he had other senseis with him there, you know, and um, they would teach too. And it was, it was like you had high school students all the way to um, seniors. And when I was in that school, I was about like 40, I was in my four, um, early to mid 40s. I was there for like three years until I moved down here. And, but that was total competition, total, you know. And, and that's what he, the guy was looking for. He was, he was like scouting to see who he could bring to um, tournaments, and they would actually uh, host tournaments at that school in every February. And you, you had a, uh, you know, all um, the top judo people from uh, Jersey going there. So, so um, that's what I experienced from what I call a sports oriented the school. I don't know if anybody else had that experience like that. Not sure. I um, yeah, for I don't me, it mind was school in some schools, mm -hmm. as long as that's what they um, advertise themselves as. Yeah, that's what yeah, it was. They, right, and that, and that I'm fine with because, I mean, <laughs> they, a lot of them that I've met and seen and, and been to, they do have self-defense classes, and... And a lot of them now do officially state that the classes they're taking to train um, for sport karate for the tournament mm -hmm. will not um, be as effective as you think it is on the street, which is why we offer self-defense classes. I don't mind that. I mean, if you're training, if, if you're if you want to train to um to use, you know to to compete in tournaments to to um make a name for yourself in that respect, then that's Oh, oh it was you. it was a great place to train because it was in a high school gym and they also had like a weight room so you can go there and you can work with, I'd work out with the weight room and then go and um and do the classes and it was it was great and, and it was only like thirty five dollars a month so you can't beat that <laughs> you can't no, beat no, that thirty you know because the, you know was no really the, the guy teaching there was really no overhead because not only was he the judo sensei, but he was also the math teacher there too, because it was in high school. So he was a math teacher there. So, you know, he, so that that's why he was able to um, get used to that. You and um, the 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 main reason actually why I joined it was well, judo was my first martial art. I started judo when I was five, and um, I did it from five to eight. All right, and check this out. And Joe, you're gonna appreciate this. This is five to eight. It took me a year for every promotion, right? And then when when like when I became a yellow belt, right? They didn't give us belts. You know what we had to do? My father had to go by die, and he would die our belt. <laughs> he would die. <laughs> yeah, see, Joe knows. Ah, now that's old school. 
We would dye our belt. That's and really then when I became a green belt, what did he do? He died. He got the green dye and he <laughs> They didn't give us our belts. You know, we only got one belt. And then, all right, you 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 um earned that um the uh, the next promotion. Boom. All right, dye it. <laughs> Say, all right, you passed the test. You dye it. Well, that is kind of traditional oh, when you think about it. Cause Traditionally, you got a white belt. It became a black belt when it was really dirty. So, so um, so now I go to I um, because I know the sports you had, you know, the karate, judo, taekwondo, you know, a lot of them. And then we go to. Uh, hey, we didn't finish that before. one. You can tell my story. Okay, you want to finish that? Oh, I didn't oh, know you had one. Yeah, my. Uh, I trained well, I trained in major sport karate school. All right, so in 1979, I was uh, at European Health Spa working out, and I met one of the um, the uh, consultants. His name was John Gabriel, and he taught Taekwondo, and he taught in a system called Taichuan Dao, which is how the uh, the Taiwanese people in Taiwan uh, call Taekwondo, and it was really a combination of Taekwondo and uh, several different Chinese kung fu systems, and. Uh, the school was very sport oriented. Um, we were involved with every major sport organization there was. Uh, Crane, the Karate Referee Association of New England. Uh, another group at that time, which in upstate uh, New England was Ippon. Uh, also, Glenn Hart with the PKL, Professional Karate League. And for the under black belts, which was the Amateur Karate League. And then uh, we all, again, and. Um, uh, later on, there was organizations like NASCA with Larry Carnahan and uh, um, the NBL with Boyce Lydell. But we were in all different types. If there was a tournament division, if there was a tournament organization, we were involved in it. Back in 79, we started out with the AAU in karate. And we were doing taekwondo. and We were doing a combination of um, taekwondo, taekwondo and, like I said, and kung fu. So... We were doing uh, Okinawan weapons with a Chinese flavor to it. We were doing XMA before XMA was cool. So we were doing all the wild stuff with weaponry. We were competing like every every single month, sometimes two, and even some individuals uh, were, were competing three times a month. And, you know, we were rated. I, I remember being rated in uh, – in Karate Illustrated magazine, rated in Sport Karate magazine with Boyce Lydell, and we were chasing those points. And, uh, you know, I mean, the, the every color of the rainbow gi, there was, there was no, there was no uniformity, the rank and color. And I, I saw your star, uh, your star Spangled Banner <laughs> gi. I, I had saw stars that. and stripes. Yeah, I never won that in competition. But, I mean, you know, I... I that was a At last team. count, I think I'm up to over 160 <laughs> uniforms. But yeah, when I was competing, I mean, and it, you know, I mean, it was it was a huge deal. And you know, you lot sometimes you would get uh, certification for the next rank because you got um, you you won a tournament. You know, you would see that where where. You know, a guy, guy would be one of top-rated competitors, and it's like, okay, you got your next belt. So that so, was pretty so wild. Not... And also have – go ahead, so, please. You, know, you said, you, said um, you did XMA before XMA was XMA. So you were doing all those uh, oh, you bet. wild flips, um, all those I wild jumps. The... Oh, yeah. We were doing the spin-in twirls with the bow staff and doing three sections – three. Three section staff and flying fork Chinese kung fu work with the bow staff and uh, and the, the sai and oh yeah blowing people's minds and people would walk up to us afterwards you can't do that we just did we just did you know? exactly and now it's it's gospel in XMA you know we're doing mm -hmm. Chinese flying fork stuff over our shoulders and around our necks and you know blowing people's minds we're doing like um, whip chain work with double commas on ropes. And three section staff work and with uh, with with Okinawan weaponry and just blowing people's minds. I and love then that. And the, the, the three three that Mike Tuck, no, those guys would see us do that, and they'd be like, "Hey, we need to do that. That's cool." 
And that really became the foundation for XMA in this country. Awesome. You say, like, sectional change with commas on the end? <laughs> no, I think you said that. But what we've seen, Joe, about the double comma, you had it with um, on, on the um, three sectionals? Yeah, back then, Tadashi Yamashita, back in the day, had what he, what, 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 what he refers to as kusari gama. It's kind of a misnomer, because kusari means chain, and kama means sickle. But he would do them with ropes. He would do them with ropes. And he would do nunchaku-like movements with these kama on ropes. So what we learned, we learned like whip chain and three-section staff work. So we would take these Chinese figure eights and these Chinese flowing movements and these elbow twirls and these around-the-neck twirls and turning our heads. And we would put them in with the commas on ropes. And uh, the Okan Okinawan people would have like brain aneurysms going, you can't do that with that weapon. It's not supposed to be done that way. And I said, well, why not? You know, if we know the motion and we can apply that motion with that weapon, why can't we do it with that weapon? And boy, I'll tell you, we must, we must have caused ma major heartbreak and in rampant insanity among tournament judges. Either they give us incredibly low scores, or they think we're the best things in sliced bread. So, kama means sickle in, in Japanese? Yes, in Okinawa, yeah. Mm, okay. Because kama in Filipino means, means bed. <laughs> oh, different languages, right? Yeah. Oh, that's, C A M A, comma. That yeah. <laughs> means bed in Filipino. <laughs> when you add to it like a sickle and chain, the K sound switches to a G sound. So, kusari gama. 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 All right, so let's go to uh, anybody um, ever um, experienced uh, an MMA gym? Have ever, anybody ever trained in an MMA gym? Now, one of the one of our friends who um, used to come on here, Vic, he owns a gym. He owns a oh he owns this place called Southpaw Gym, where he's got a big um boxing ring on there, and and he teaches boxing and stuff. But he's also teaches FMA and Silat. He's more of an FMA and Silat guy, and he he's a retired CO corrections officer. <clears throat> got a beautiful beautiful gym, and I and um. Uh, I, I actually taught a seminar there um, last February. Beautiful gym. Nice. So, I mean, that's the closest I've ever came to. Um, if you would want to classify it as an MMA gym. But, uh, you know, well, MMA, uh, and usually what they, what, what do they train in MMA? And Muay Thai, BJJ, boxing, wrestling. Those are the arts that you usually get in an MMA gym. Right. Yeah. So I think a lot of the MMA gyms, like, and I, I have trained in an MMA gym. Um, however, um, I will say that I was not training in MMA, but I, I have witnessed like, those gyms. Um, usually they break down their classes to mm -mm. grappling, striking, um, you know, and they separate those and then the people that want to do the whole MMA thing, like, or somebody that's trained to go into a fight will, um, combine them. Um, and I've had, had sparred. Oh, what, like, what were you doing at an like, MMA gym? What were you? You said you weren't training there. You weren't training in MMA. Um, you were training in something else. What were you training there? Well, so I was training Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu at the time, and then it came to a point where you know I was I was working at night, but I was training in the mornings um, with a with a just doing the morning trainings. Um, these people, and um, they, they 
came about was somebody needed a sparring partner, and we just put on some MMA gloves, shin pads, and head gear, and um, we did striking and grappling at the same time. But I they did put people in MMA fights, but I wasn't studying MMA. Just, just BJJ. Yeah, I was just doing BJJ. Like part of MMA. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. Like, is there an MMA school, or is it just? Yeah, you have MMA schools. schools. You have a lot of them. Yeah, I have one in town, the town that I live in. Yeah. Mhm. You have an MMA school. Yeah. This is almost showing my age. This is almost twenty. You're the baby. Yeah. Might be you and now. Sandy are the baby. Oh, thanks. Oh. <laughs> oh, see, my understanding of MMA schools, um, the way that MMA has changed so much over the years, and how the rules have changed, so that there could be um, less injury within the um, the octagon, that you can now officially state there are traditional MMA schools who teach the way it was taught when MMA first came out, where almost no no rules, no hold barred, and now you have the more um, modern MMA school, MMA school that is teaching the art based off of the rules. Oh, you mean when when you when UFC first came out? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, where there were no um, there were no uh, well, they did have I don't know, did they have time limits? I know that there was no weight divisions. Oh, and you could no time like, limits, oh, nothing, no holds barred. That was Everything the best. Was you just time couldn't time. do all. You just couldn't do eye gouges or fish hooks. No fish hooks. Yeah. And now it's on the way of there have been so many rules added to it for um, the injury, which understandable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but so yeah, now you can actually classify um, yeah. those those MMA things as well as traditional and the more modern that go based yeah. off the rules. Okay. I, I think with the MMA, when UFC first came out, I, I think the good, in my opinion, in my opinion, is that, you know, people had to realize that they had to be more of a well-rounded um, fighter. They had to be more of a well-rounded martial artist. You can only, you couldn't only be a striker. You, you know, you had to learn some, um, some groundwork. You know, some grappling groundwork. Um, you know, um, you had to learn also how to do um, blocks, you know, submission holds, chokes, and all that. So I think um, I, I, that's what I see, you know, what UFC did. I know that the when UFC first came out, the main objective of UFC was to show that Gracie Jiu-Jitsu um, beat everything. That's what it was. Because who, because who, who um, who um belonged to? It belonged to the Gracies. It was uh, Horion who um, started that. Yeah. No, it was Horion. Horion was the one that ran the the organization, started. But it was Hoist that did all the fighting. Yeah. I don't know, but I will stay on record. Like I think any Kaji Kembo like guy that like trained hard in Kaji Kembo would have done well. In of the beginning of it? Yeah. Yeah, there's Kaji Kemba, didn't it? I mean, like, well, they, they what, what you had, karate, like, boxing, the judo. Had, they had to do anything with really close, like, you know, Ken Shamrock, right? It was a shoot fight. Mm-hmm. Kaji Kemba was like, they did everything. Like, I don't know, Kemba Joe probably talks more about Kaji Kemba than me, but from what I know about Kaji Kemba, from Hawaii. Oh, that was badass like, shit. That, and, yeah, no, had judo, had boxing, had karate, had tempo, right. and uh, who the the last surviving um founder was Imperiato. Used to Imperato. say that you know um the Imperato. He used to say that classes doesn't end until he sees blood on the floor. <laughs> that was then. That was like you know when you could teach it back then like that. Now. Now it's like, oh, get, guy gets punched in the face. Oh, he runs to his mommy. Mommy, mommy. 
Man, no, those schools still exist, today. man. Hard, anybody who tells you the hard core schools don't exist anymore is lying to themselves. You just got to find people that are willing to still do it. Oh, I know. Exactly. I'm not saying that they don't exist. I'm saying that, you know, I, I mean, no problem whatsoever. I mean, back then, like, all right. So I will, like I said, I started judo when I was five years old. Right. So at the end, we had end of every class, we had Randori and we were like getting thrown around. We were like, you know, kids were throwing, we were really fighting. Oh, and kids would get hurt. I remember, um, I, I had to sprain my ankle at a competition, you know, but still, like, we still fought. You know, we didn't run, I didn't run to mommy and go, mommy. you know, not like now. And then, and I didn't get a partici participation trophy either. <laughs> I got third place, but it was, it was third place. It wasn't a participation uh, trophy, you know. It was one of those trophies that you earned. And I did that with a sprained ankle, you know. I had fun. It's just a little about um, a little background of like um, when I did judo. Right. So I come from a uh, um, a military family. Um, my father was in the navy, right? And my father, I grew up mostly in. Um, you know, I was born in Connecticut, and they have a um, a naval base there. Um, like Rotten right. sub base. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's like. And I mean, I practically lived on there. I mean, used to go there all the time, you know, you know, get groceries. So they had this thing called um, the Dulcum. And the Dulcum was a place where I took judo, right? And I think, you know, the, the cost was very minimal. But the thing was, like, I couldn't go around in school saying, like, hey, I'm a badass. Like, I'll do – because, like, 20% of the people that went to my grammar school went to the judo school. Because, you know, they were all Navy, Navy families. So the thing was, like, if I had a problem with somebody, they'd say, all right, I'll see you tonight at judo. <laughs> that's, how, that's how we ironed out everything. <laughs> and there was these, these two kids that, I'll never forget, David and Bunky. They were brothers. And I, I happened to be, <laughs> I threw both of them. One landed on his head. <laughs> well, you think two weeks later, they both show up at the judo class. <laughs> and then the one kid becomes like oh, my close friend. I actually saved his life. He fell um in um in an ice pond and I pulled him out. Yeah. Wow. But that was like, you know, that was that was I mean those days, you know, we'd get injured, we'd get through it and, and everything that we got we earned. I remember um like you know, I'm eight years old. I'm choking out somebody, you know, just to get my green belt. I had to choke somebody out, right? Eight years old. And then they didn't hand me a green belt. All right, go get the green dye. You have to dye your belt. My dad taking my yellow belt, dyeing it, and making it green, you know? But those were those were the old days. Those were the fun days back when I was a kid. I don't know if you ever experienced that, Joe, that you had to dye your belt. No, that was I, – I came in on the tail end of that. So I was at mm -hmm. the first commercial school I ever trained with was the United Studios of Self Defense back in the early 1970s. So they already had the belts there. Um, my dad actually went through that a little bit. He trained with a gentleman who taught uh, Kyokushin and uh, Shotokan in New Bedford. So, but yeah, uh, he I, got he got in you know, yeah, early uh, 70s. That was me. 70. When did I start judo? Maybe like 1970, 71. Yeah. I was five. Seventy. Yeah, it was nineteen seventy. I was five years old. Well, you know, you were talking about Imperado and uh, Oswald was mentioned about uh <coughs> Kaju Kembo. You wanna see what real Kaju Kembo is, you go watch up the T V series Fight Quest and look up their Kaju Kembo episode. And you'll see old school Kaju Kembo who is still doing out in Cali and it's like if you can't hang, you can't bang, you don't stay. You know, I say goodbye. You know, um, uh, but, Joe, what's, uh, yeah, what's uh, the name of your, uh, your YouTube channel? Because I'm going to put it on um, my uh, thing. It's, I mean, you can just punch in Kenfo Joe 1 with the number 1. It's all one word. Uh, but, yeah, we talk about like MMA, arts? one of my students. Huh? Isn't it Martial Arts TV? Say again? 
Martial Arts TV. Isn't that no, that's my stuff? TV show. Martial yeah. Arts Today TV. There were nine major cable systems, over a million households, all throughout southeastern Massachusetts, and then we have specific extended episodes exclusive to YouTube. Right, but your, your YouTube channel is Campo Joe 1. Yep. Yeah, that's the I'm channel. The channel is because Ken Pojo was available, wasn't available at that time. Somebody else had it, and uh, it was funny. A couple really? of those people have had it on the internet and different things. And they've contacted me and they've apologized to me for having Ken Pojo. I'm like, they didn't apologize from it. I don't know the trademark to it, you know. But they, oh yeah, but you're a lot more than I'm doing with it. And I'm like, no, nah, man, it's okay, you know. But if you look up, you punch in Google Kenpo, Kenpo Joe, Google actually goes, do you mean Kenpo Joe Rebello? And that's the ultimate compliment I can ever get, you know? Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's move on. The next, the next one I have on my list, uh, and I, I think too bad Tom and Miff are with this one, the reality arts, the reality-based reality -based, uh, self-defense. We've heard about a lot about that, and then we've heard about people that that's say um, I'm not gonna say they claim that that that's what they teach. Um, geez, uh, I had a list in my head, and now it escapes me. Um, Krav Maga, Sistema. Yeah. Uh, no, not, I'm not talking about know, the arts. Yeah. I'm talking about the uh, the uh, guys that teach it, like oh, like a guy you know, named like Bill Bill Kip. Have you ever you have heard of Bill Kip? Bill Kip, the Bullet Man. Um, Bullet Man. Gosh, who's the guy? Who's you got the, guy? the spear guy, Tony Bauer. Tony Bauer. Uh, Tony's been on my Are show. Um, the people that Are teach. Are we talking about the guys who um, claim to have adjusted the art from the past? Be more modernized and they created a whole new system. Oh, I don't. Um, I'm just saying that they they say that they're more realistic, that they the realism. You know. So um, we're talking about guys that are like Kevin Justin, like maybe Krav Maga. Or no, Krav Maga is different. I have yeah, that on Krav a different Krav 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 You know that orientation. I, I have that under um kind of more like um. Modern, westernized um, um, arts, because you do have the okay. yeah, the, like Krav Maga, Sistema. You have um, Defendo, Combat. Oh, that's an oldie, man. Started, Pulling out an oldie. Yeah, military combatives. Yeah, 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 combatives. World War Two combatives. The Fairbane. Oh, the Fairbane. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love uh, Fairbane. I love Charles that. Charles Nelson out of New York. Charles Nelson. Bradley I've studied um, the Charles. I've done the Charles Nelson with um, uh, with his successor, uh, who's actually um on my uh, oh, wow. Facebook um, um, page, and that I I like um, uh, the uh, Charles Nelson system. I really like another it. guy, uh, Peter Freeman, out of New Hampshire. He's he's another one, Katsugo. He sounds. Doesn't he do FMA? Is he the guy with the beard that's all, yeah, that's all braided up? Yep. Yeah, because I know he does FMA too. Yeah. Yep. Oh, you bet. Yeah, Trained with like George that. Bruce, Chinese club. Uh, did La Nada. Did uh, yeah, several different systems. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. You know, you guys were right because I do have on the reality the World World War II um, West Combatives. No Rex Applegate, not... Sykes Fairbane. Yep, yep. Applegate. Sykes. But, uh, my favorite I mean... phrase is you'd rather be tried by 12 than carried by 6. I love that. Oh, yeah. We always say that all the time. That's, um, that's what my uh, cop friends, my best friends of law enforcement, you know, they said that, you know, they're... You know, better to be judged by 12 than carried by 6. But I love, love that. I love the uh, World War II combatives. And, uh, oh, this is what I, you got to check this out, right? You can find a lot of, a, 
bunch of World War II combatives on YouTube, but I found the World War II combatives, like what the Germans taught in World War II. I, I found videos of that on YouTube. It's just you know, awesome. Yeah, it's pretty good. I even downloaded it. Well, Fergie, I mean, you remember that guy who did uh, Boris Jutsu? No. Um, uh, oh. That was listed in um, the Sherlock Holmes uh, books. Oh, Barbitsu. Yeah, that's yeah. um, yeah, you you know Sandy Jesse. Yeah, that is in New York. Barbitsu. Yeah, that's how um, yeah, I did that Barbitsu. Actually, now that I know. actually um, Joe, the last um. Taikai that you were at, my friend Jesse was there, but, you know, remember there were so many people that, you know, it, that, there were so many people there that we, they couldn't fit everybody in, and Jesse was there, and he was oh. going to show Bartitsu, but the next year, he yep, showed Bartitsu. I remember, I got to watch it. He was shocked, I knew yeah. He came in, he was. came in in his little Bartitsu Yeah. Yeah, and the he whole tradition, yeah, it was great. It was, that is his gig, man. That's how he has no, it. No, no, but yeah. the year after, the year after, um, he comes in and he's got like this little like um, vest on and the Bartitsu thing like that. And uh, Dr. Fabris goes, whoa, look at him. <laughs> he's, this guy's all dressed up. But yeah, Bartitsu, that's fun. That's, that's, a, that's a lot of fun. And uh, I, I gained an appreciation for the, um, the uh, scientific polgarism, you know, they, the way that they, people used to, laugh about that no, but a... you know if you think about it there's a lot of um uh, relationship to like th this is like the chain punch in um in wing chung so... or xing yi another one with the uppercuts yep yep, Reversing yep. forward and back mm -hmm. oh that was that was fun to do part because everybody would drive except me i never dressed up you know, but and uh I, I also uh, I'm not... through Jesse I trained uh, trained with a guy um oh what was his name who was uh, really um uh, an authority on Bartitsu oh uh, Professor Mark Donnelly really cool guy really cool guy and he he uh, he um really knew his stuff too and and Bartitsu it's a, it's a, it's a fun art to do it's like one of those fun arts you know for the for that kind of box, look up a book by Jim Driscoll called Straight Left. Um, it's a really great boxing manual from like the early 20th century, like old UK boxing. Um, straight. Yeah, Straight Left. By who? By Jim Driscoll. Driscoll. Okay. That's, that's old school um, British boxing. Yeah. I'll say, like, you know, a lot of people forgot. Oh my god, I that's some badass friend. shit. My, 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 um, my, my, uh, what do you call it? My, um, my gun disarms. Most of my gun disarms come from Prague. Yeah. Yeah. They all come I from mean, Prague. I think, like, a lot of that has, depends on the teacher that, or the person you're training with. You know? Oh, yeah. I mean, the guy that taught me um, did Krav also, and he did, uh, I mean, my teacher did, my teacher's, like, um, like, uh, Kempo Joe, he did all these arts, you know, um, uh, well, that, that's another topic. <laughs> I don't want to go into that, but, but I love Krav. Krav? And, and you can't, you know, you... I'm, it's used by the Israeli army. Is there's, there's special forces, you know, and um, I just think it, it, that's one of those styles that gets a bad name. They're kind of like you get too many instructors too fast. Yeah, yeah that's you know that's yeah. kind of like um, something that's also coming up the belt factories that we'll talk about. But there was another one that um, I checked out Kapop. A pop is good. It's kind of like a front runner to um to um Krav. A pop. Yeah, that. There's so there's so many Philip. Oh, sorry. Because Krav Maga is in the Polish ghetto. No, Krav Krav Maga. 
Krav Maga, they, uh, they have um, both military and um, civilian. But Kapap also, you know, came out of from Israel. And, uh, oh, who was that guy that, um, I have his book. And Kapap now, they've actually, Kapap, what they've done is they've gotten together with the Machados, the Machado brothers. And they, I don't know who they got from FMA, but they also incorporated some FMA into it. They have FMA and they have um, the Machados and and them. And uh, they um, they brought their resources and skills together. And um, and uh, learn more like stuff because they ran out of material. You know, I mean that that's oh. really it. I mean that's the bottom line. There's a very limited structure. Here's my Krav Maga story. It's 1981. I'm in Yorktown, New York. I'm at a, I'm at a friend of mine's place. Uh, her father is, is Jewish, and he knows this guy that they lived in the same kibbutz together in Israel. So I walk in, they introduce me. Oh, this is, this is Irmi Lichtenfeld. I was like, the Irmi Lichtenfeld? The, Irmi, the founder? <laughs> I didn't know it was a the. He goes, are you the founder of Krav Maga? He goes, Krav Maga? <laughs> Oh, Krav Maga. I said, read an article on you in Black Belt Magazine. This is when nobody knew what Krav Maga was. He was shocked I even knew what it was. Yeah. This is long before it was in this country. Oh, my God. I would have uh, if, if like, cell wow. phones yeah. existed, you'd take pictures of them. And gorilla fighting, and you teach them a side. He looks mm -hmm. over at the gentleman, the father of my, my friend. He goes, wow, I like this guy already. <laughs> everybody likes everybody well, loves back Joe. 1982, nobody knew what Krav Maga was. Yeah, nobody knew. Probably badass stuff. Oh, oh Sandy, um, I I met a guy uh, who teaches Krav, right? Uh huh. And if you close your eyes and listen to the guy talking, and even if you watch him, like if he didn't turn around, you just watch him from the back. You'd have thought it was Jesse. Really? Exact man, yeah, exact mannerism. I said, "Oh, Sandy's got to meet this guy." <laughs> exact mannerism and everything. Really, really nice guy. Really. Um... So why don't we have Jesse in these chats? Oh, I don't know. I I can't. Uh, I don't know what's going on with him. I mean, I don't know. You know, he. Uh, I don't. I don't think he's with uh, Saluddin Sal anymore. Since, um, yeah, you know, as soon as I met him, I just, I was like in awe of him. He just, but, persona, personality. Yeah. Oh, he's a great guy. Great guy. Great guy. And he, um, what do you call, uh, he lives in Bethlehem now or somewhere. I know he lives in PA. I think he lives in Bethlehem. Yeah, I know him because you told me he was in PA. I didn't know it was Bethlehem. Yeah. All right. So now let's, let's, let's go on to the fun ones. All right. Belt factories. Oh. <laughs> belt factories and go. sometimes belt factories, you can say belt factories slash daycare centers. <laughs> A.K.A. McDojo's. They, they, they like quantity instead of quality. Mm -hmm. You go get a. Well, it's that the Who wants to take that one on? A lot of people do. It's easy <laughs> martial arts. You do a master of the partial arts. Little Johnny and little Susie gets a gets a stripe every two to three weeks. Little Johnny and little Susie get a new belt, new pretty belt every every two to three months. You know, little Johnny or little Susie can't do anything wrong. They're so good, they defecate ice cream. Wow, I love ice cream. Yeah, I want to catch it before you drink that, right? <laughs> they don't want to catch that. I don't want to see you snarfing water out of your nose on chat. Yeah. And, we'll and, guarantee um, little Johnny and little Susie a black belt in one to two years. And you know, multiple trophies, like, participation trophies. Oh, you bet. You bet. It's the nobody sucks in this place locate, you know, tournament, you know. 
somebody, I think it was Leo, Leon um, Majors, he posted something, and I, had, and I saved it. It was a picture of this um, sensei giving this uh, eight-year-old a black belt and saying, congratulations. Oh, I know that. Your mother's check cleared. Mom's cleared. <laughs> they were available, man. Oh, and man. the sad part was this picture, an actual black belt test. That was the sad yeah. part. I know. That he was that, giving that it is like sad. an eight-year-old a black belt. And not, and you know what? I'm, I'm a firm advocate in junior black belts and apprentice black belts and different mm -hmm. levels according to age brackets and abilities. In Japan, they don't, it's very rare they give junior black belts. You know, they, they're like, you know, they're, they're not caught up in it. They don't, they don't worry about it, you know? Um, but here it's like, you know, I got my black belt on a side order of fries. It's no. What is the proper age for somebody to achieve black belt? That's that's a that's like that's a good question. It is a good that's question, awesome. but you got to take that on a case to case, you know. Because I, I went to this I, um, I I went to the, um this thing called Battle of the Orient years ago, right? And it it's it's um. It's hosted by the the uh, Harangdo guys, and they had this Harangdo kid straight out of Korea, and it was black belt, right? And they showed him doing the movements, and they were just like, just super crisp, super, you know, better than a lot of uh, um, black belts twice his age. Sure. Yeah. But... And then again, like, what is your, uh, what, um, oh, there geez, what are my belts and there are black belts, you know? I mean, for people to say, if you've got a nine-year-old can pop off the material and perform it, why shouldn't he get a black belt? But, you know, the mm -hmm. other mindset is, okay, that eight-year-old or ten-year-old, you know, fight, and I don't mean spar, I mean fight a fully grown adult. Yeah, and that's the is, big bone of know, content. With yeah, false security. That's the, that's my thing. It's like you know, they give these kids false. Security. Not only do they give the kids false security, they're giving their parents false security. Now their parents are going, "Oh, I got a my my kid's a black belt." You know, I I put yeah, a, I I saw this. I'm sorry, Sandy. Go ahead, Sandy. You go first. Yeah, that's the problem. Who will say, "Oh, my kid's a black belt." That means that um. I can let them walk home from school at nine years old. Because they can. All right, I'm back. We're back live. Had a little technical difficulty. My freaking battery. But we're, we're up to uh, Belt Factory slash Daycare Center. So, um, who, who wants to take that one? You know, Daycare Centers make huge amounts of money. They make uh, the bonnet sprays, crazy, stupid money. Oh, yeah. You know, and that, that was just one of the intelligent things to do in that industry. They were like, hey, we're missing out on some major money here. Little Johnny and little Susie want to learn karate. Great. We'll pick them up right at school. We'll bring them over to the dojo. We'll mm -hmm. have a place where they can sit there and do their homework. And we'll make sure they do their homework so they don't have to go home and wonder if they're going to do it. And then we'll make sure that they will charge an, an absorbent rate. This is absorbent the daycare centers mm -hmm. are charging. But they'll be safe because they'll be at the dojo waiting for you. And if they finish and their homework, we'll give them a star on their belt. <laughs> do you know some of those dojo will actually have, have actually hired tutors to help the kids with their homework? Exactly. Yep. So that yeah, cost and, goes and back onto the parent. Right, yep, and you exactly. know what? It was, it was a good way to make money for a dojo. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of them charge less than what the daycares are charging. So, uh, mm -hmm. so a parent will be more than happy to bring little Johnny or little Susie to the dojo or dojang or the studio because they're paying less than what they would pay at, say, 
I'll use a local name, though it isn't, I'm not, not no aspersions upon it. In our area, we have Little People's College, and they're a wonderful, very successful daycare center. And they have a, as a matter of fact, they bought one of the old club, uh, mall strip malls where I used to have my, my karate school back in the 1980s. That's the kind of money they were making. They're buying out full blown strip malls because they're making so much money. Yep. Yep. Well, the studios go, well, Six we'll figures. undercut you and charge less than what you're charging, and we'll keep the students in, and they'll be able to take karate classes and be tutored and be able to have a place that they can have a daycare. Mm-hmm. So little, little Johnny and little Susie are now caught up in the, in the whole ambiance of this. And not to mention, hey, hey, we've got our specially written up minivan that will pick little Johnny and little Susie up at, the, at their school and bring them to the dojo. You won't have to worry about picking up and bringing them to school for the mild and extra on, fee of blank me blank blank. Mm-hmm. And on top of that, you don't have to worry about going to pick them up at the daycare and then bringing them to the dojo for their karate class. They'll already be here. Mm-hmm. You just gotta leave work and go to the dojo to. Mm-hmm. And you're gonna be late. Not a problem. We'll take care of your child for X amount of dollars for every extra hour. I'm telling and, you. And, and we'll and we'll teach them responsibility. You know, we'll have them clean the dojo. <laughs> we'll have them clean. And we got the people work to show it. Washing windows. See, and little Johnny's got to bring home their paper. And they've got to make sure you, as a parent, got to initial it. They've got to clean their room. They have to brush their teeth. They have to learn how to use a washing machine. Mm-hmm. They have to learn, oh, man. And it's like, guess what? We're going to give your kid a chore list. And he's got to do his chores. And if he doesn't, guess what? Maybe, maybe, little Johnny will they won't get their next pretty strike and they'll feel like crap when all the other kids are brought up for their strike from good citizens three and oops little 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 Bobby or little Buffy <laughs> didn't do their scores and oops they're, sitting, they're all bent out of shape because the 14 other other kids did it and they didn't do it well you know if you were really a good child and you weren't a piece of junk maybe you do is you get your strike but no, you stink on ice. <laughs> you're not defecating ice cream this week, little Bobby. Oh, no. And hey, you're behind all the other students. <laughs> I'm surprised. I'm surprised. I'm surprised. I'm surprised. I'm surprised. I'm But you know what, little Bobby and little Susie? You don't stink on ice because as soon as you pay for an additional private lesson with the instructor, I'm sure that we can clear all that up and I'm sure you're going to be a better citizen, and I'm sure the check will clear. <laughs> you know what has me confounded? How, how like, this morphed from when I was a child in martial arts class, and if I did something wrong at home and I was getting punished at home, my parents would be like, I'm going to tell Sifu Gaul. And I'd be afraid because that meant that I was going to get in trouble in karate class, too. Life. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I was going to get punished. I was going to punish at home and punish in class. How many push-ups am I going to be doing? You know, who's going to be kicking my butt and, and sparring that, that day? You know, so yeah, but now morphing how it's morphed into this weird, you know, okay, let's make sure we do everything we're supposed to do. Yeah, like I said, when I was a kid, I can remember, yeah, you get punished twice. If you did something wrong at home, they would go back and tell, tell Sifu. Yeah, I never had that problem. <laughs> oh, yeah. Fear, fear breeds respect. I love that. Uh, fear breeds respect. <laughs> oh, there's, a lot, there's a lot of truth in that. Kids, I mean, you know, nowadays people say, what's the problem? Kids are not afraid of anything anymore. That's true. When you were a child, when you were a child if you were brought up in a religious background, you feared God. Mm-hmm. You feared mm-hmm. righteous retribution. You feared hell. I still do. I still fear you that. Dojo. You feared sensei. Because simply stated, you gave him crap, he bumps you off a wall. Mm. You got a side kick or a reverse punch, and you don't think I'll do it? No problem. Hey, I'll get little Johnny or little Susie that's the same rank as you. Sparrow. 
I remember. And when you got the proverbial crap kicked out of you and let you knew better. Mm-hmm. You got up and bowed in courtesy and you sat there and sobbed, sorry I messed up. Mm-hmm. And you know, no. now I'll just hear anything. I'll call DS man, I hear kids, kids, I'll call DSS on you. Yeah. I'll call child services on you. You know, you know, that that happened to um somebody at work, right? The kid said that. So you know what the guy did? He sent this kid back to the Philippines. <laughs> See ya. And then he said, "All right, now you try that shit on me." <laughs> yep. Guess what? You're going home. Oh, I'm sorry. My... You spell the word country at this. Oh no, they would go home. They and they they, they would punish him there. You know, like. I mean, guys, when I was raised, man, my father took out that belt. He whipped it out like it was a freaking samurai sword. <laughs> you know? And you feared it. You feared it. But I didn't, you know. You put, here's, okay, here's the trivia question for tonight. Name two famous martial artists that were kicked out of their own countries because they had a bad attitude and it was sent, it was sent somewhere else. Oh, really? I don't know. Anybody wasn't Bruce, Bruce Lee, Lee or not allowed? No, back Bruce Lee. Bruce, Bruce Lee was Bruce Lee. I from what I heard, it was his father that brought him back to America. Who well, brought him to America? No, Bruce Lee no, got kicked out because he was he... a punk in a gang. Oh, really? Yeah, Bruce Lee got kicked yeah. out because yeah. he was a famous actor, and the chief of police for Hong Kong walked in and said, if "You don't get your kid out of here. He's going to be dead or in jail." Mm-hmm. Which yep. one? One from column A, one from column B, and I don't mean a Chinese menu. <laughs> so he technically wasn't kicked out. He was kind of like forced out. Yeah. Yeah. That's why he was sent to America. And he was sent to sweet. And the only mm. reason he was sent to America is he already was an American citizen. Yeah, yeah. He was born That's here. Yep. He was born in San Who's Francisco. The second one. Who's the second one? Yep. Jean Claude Van Damme. Nope. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, I know. I know. Joe Rabello. <laughs> nope. no. A lot more famous than me. Andy Lynn. Nobody can be famous than you. Uh, Jerry, right, Jerry's like a nice guy. Bing, 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 so. bing, 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 no, it's going to be like an instructor, right? So. Uh, does it? I, I okay. cannot know. Freddy, give me an answer. I have no idea. Then get your guess. Oh, I did. I said, um, uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme. <laughs> okay. Sandy? Gently. Okay, give us, give us, a, give us a country that he picked oh, out. Gently stayed in America, uh, stayed in China. Okay. No, give, give us a country that he was. Well, Sandy, here's your hint. You're close. <gasps> no way. That's your hint. You're close. I mean, she's close to what? The answer, or she's close to the, the person that country. got. Oh, well, it wasn't Jet Li. Right. Jet Li is on us. Yes, take a guess. He wasn't kicked out. Guy Fong Chin was not kicked out of China, though, was he? Gang, Gang Fong Chin? Yeah, he wasn't. Oh, is he famous? Anybody, anybody no. get, yeah, you don't want me to talk to somebody about Fong Chin. I got some, I got some really bad stories about that guy. Yeah, we'll do well, that out off, so offline. Yeah, we'll talk about that later. We'll talk about that later. Not the answer? I was surprised when Yeah, I what's the about answer? Donnie Yen. Oh, wow. Donnie Yen? Donnie Yen was involved with gangs in Boston. You know. Oh, yeah, he Chinese is from Boston. Black rappers. Yeah. Uh, Great dancers. And what happened was. Uh, the chief of police of Boston showed up at Bosin Mock's house and said, your son, if he sticks around with the crowd he's with, mm-hmm. we can't deport him because he's a U.S. citizen, but he's going to be dead or he's going to be in jail. You need to get your son out of the country. Not just out of the state, out of out the of country. country. Wow. Next day, goes up and guess what? You're going to mainland China to go learn wushu. 
and you're going yeah. today. But his mother, wasn't his mother um, of a martial artist? Didn't she do Tai Chi? Of course, Boxer Mark, world famous wushu yeah, practitioner. Yeah. But when Donnie doing outside of the Kung Fu in the wushu studio, he was hanging around with a wild crowd. Mm. Donnie Yen, I remember when back when I was in the Philippines, he came out with this movie about Tai Chi. He was really young. He yep. was in his 20s. I for Chi master. Yep, yep, that's what it was. Drunken Chi Chi. Yeah, yeah. It was uh it was young and it was uh I think I was it was back in the eighties. Had to be maybe uh eighty five, eighty six sometime there. But yeah, I remember it. Down... Is that the one with the ball? Donnie, yeah, the guy who played um Itman. Yeah. Played in nine. He played in uh, Rush Hour as Rush, one of the villains. Yeah. Um, he played in. Uh, um, he was one of the villains in Rush Hour. Cage. He played in. I know he was uh, in uh, with Jackie uh, Chan in uh, the Shanghai Nights. Yep. Shanghai but I don't. Knights. I don't. I don't remember him in um. Rush Hour. That's the Japanese in guy, ha ha Hakuryu Sanada. Oh, Henry Sonata, yep. Yeah, Happy Sonata. Remember, remember, in, um, Ninja in the uh, Dragons Den. <laughs> I got that movie. Yep. Uh, Conan Lee. Uh, Conan Lee. Yep. All right. Okay. So basically, that's my list, and um, I want to kind of end this because uh, I want to pick uh, Joe's brain. <laughs> <laughs> so every. So, Joe, what questions? So so um. I'm going to, I want to thank everybody who came. Sorry for that technical difficulty we got um, earlier. But what I'm going to do, what I've been doing is I've been editing everything and uh, like, uh, taking out a lot of the um, tangents and uh, putting um, putting on some labels too. So uh, I'll do that over the weekend and I will um, put it on uh, YouTube. So uh, guys, want to say goodbye, good night to everybody. Good night. Good night, Facebook. Good night. And we'll see you, um... Good night, everyone. We'll see you I'm next week. Talking. I'm talking much. I never shut up. Yeah. We'll, we'll see you next week.